Good afternoon. My name is Bill Bodie. I'd like to welcome you all to CSIS for this live and webcast launch event for the latest publication by one of the leading public intellectuals of our time, Dr. Elliot Cohen, author of the new book from which I just quoted, The Hollow Crown, Shakespeare on How Leaders Rise, Rule, and Fall, published today by Basic Books. Now, James Mattis described Eliot as, quote, one of the rare people who, like Hamlet, can rightly claim to be a man of thought and a man of action. Another former Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, called the hollow crown, quote, a must read for self-understanding for all those who seek or hold power and for those who seek insight about them from the greatest observer of human nature in the English language. Elliot Cohen is the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy here at CSIS, where he directs research on the changing character of warfare and grand strategy. He is also the Robert Osgood Professor at the School of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University, where he has taught for over 30 years and also served as dean. He is the author or co-author slash editor of over 10 books and he is the co-host, along with Eric Edelman, of the podcast, Shield of the Republic. And if that's not enough, in the world of politics and government, he has served in senior positions in both the Department of State, where he was counselor to the Secretary of State, and the Department of Defense, where he ran the, uh, the DOD's policy planning staff. He also worked on the 2012 presidential campaign of Mitt Romney, and was one of the most prominent and vocal never-Trump figures, an act of Shakespearean moral courage and conviction given the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune he subsequently suffered. We are also delighted to welcome to CSIS today two guest commentators on The Hollow Crown. Yoni Applebaum is the deputy editor at The Atlantic, where he also served as columnist and a senior editor for politics. He has written on American politics and history, as well as appearing on Atlantic Radio and numerous podcasts. Before the Atlantic, Dr. Applebaum taught history and literature at Harvard, and he previously taught at Babson College and Brandeis University, where he received his PhD in American history. Drew Lichtenberg has served for more than a decade as the resident dramaturg at the Shakespeare Theatre Company here in Washington also known as the Chief Literary Officer, a scholar who provides historical and critical context to the theater's productions. Uh, Drew also lectures at the Catholic University of America, uh, the Geffen School of Drama at Yale, where he received his doctorate, and the Lang College of Liberal Arts at the New School. He is a widely published author himself, including numerous theater journal articles and an upcoming book on the Shakespeare Theater Company for the Arden series. And he recently published a piece in the New York Times with the arresting title, Cancel Shakespeare. Spoiler alert, his tongue was fully planted in cheek. We will begin with, a few, with some remarks by uh, Dr. Cohen, followed by uh, uh, remarks and Q&A with, with our commentators. And then we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A with our live audience. So, Elliot, lay on, Macduff. Well, thank you, Bill. One of the... One of the things our listeners should know is uh, uh, Bill, in addition to all the other things that he does at CSIS and has done over his career, is also a Shakespearean actor. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very grateful to my colleagues at CSIS for, uh, for arranging and hosting this. Um, and I'm particularly glad to have two friends and colleagues uh, to discuss this book with me. I thought what I would do is just say a few words at the beginning about why I wrote the book, a little bit about how it's organized, and why I think uh, Shakespeare is something to tell us about politics and power. So the, the, you know, um, most of my career has been spent as a military historian, as a foreign policy expert, serving in government. Uh, so writing a book about literature might seem a bit strange. But the truth is, a number of years ago, my wife and I were attending a performance of Henry VIII, uh, which is a play not often put on. Uh, which the authorship for a while was disputed. I think there's probably a little bit more consensus now that it was a joint effort between Shakespeare and another playwright. But there is a, a, a speech there which is, I think, all Shakespeare, and it's by Cardinal Wolsey, 
who's effectively been the prime minister for Henry VIII, a, a dangerous position to have, um, and he's suddenly deposed. And it's, a, it's a, a soliloquy where he says, I've swum too long upon a sea of glory, uh, like little wanton boys that swim on bladders at last, my high-blown pride burst within me and I sink never to rise again. And it's, um, it goes on longer than that, um, but it's very, very powerful. And I remember as we were watching, I was thinking to myself, I know that guy. And I think if you, if you, particularly if you live in Washington and you've been engaged in politics, uh, you do know that guy and others. Well, one thing led to another. I ended up teaching uh, some courses on Shakespeare and politics, and, and I come up with the book. Uh, the book is not, it's a bit unusual in its organization. Most books about Shakespeare go play by play. And I've decided not to do that. Instead, the book is organized around the arc of power, how power is acquired, how it's exercised, and then how people either lose it or uh, walk away from it. And for a number of reasons, which we can discuss, that, that seemed to me a much more sensible approach, and it, it allows you to do some fun things, like compare characters like King Lear and, um, and Prospero in The Tempest. Um, and what I try to do is to weave into this a lot of history, a lot of observation of contemporary politics and political figures, some of my own experiences in government and uh, having served as a dean, um, and so tie that all together. So w what does Shakespeare have to teach us about politics and power? And the three of us should probably have a conversation about why, how we think Shakespeare learned some of the things he learned. And I would say three big things. One is Shakespeare is resolutely focused on character. And he's not interested in mass movements as far as I can tell. There's, there are some mass movements in it. He's, uh, economics, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of economics out of Shakespeare. What you will get is the study of human character. And if there's anything we've learned in recent years it is just how important character is. Um, I, one of the things I describe in the book is uh, attending a big national security conference in uh, late February of 2022, just days before Vladimir Putin launched his invasion, renewed invasion of Ukraine. And I remember the consensus being that if he did something, it would be measured, it would be limited, it would be controlled, and that was on the basis of previous experience. And I didn't really think so. And the reason why had nothing to do with my understanding of Russia, it had everything to do with having reread Richard III for the eighth or ninth or tenth time. Because in, in Richard III, what happens is Richard III, one of Shakespeare's consummate villains, has spent the first three acts of the play, he's killing people, he has his brother drowned in a cask of wine, he's a dastardly figure, but he's clever, he's adroit, he's indirect. In act four, he commits the really big crime, which is the murder of his two nephews in the Tower of London. And all of a sudden, he's very blunt, and he says, I want the bastards dead and wish it done suddenly. Do you understand? His loyal lieutenant hesitates a little bit, and then next thing you know, he's, um, he is doomed as well. And the, the point that I took away from that is that Shakespeare shows us how Richard III's character had changed. It had always been bad, but uh, now he doesn't feel he has to be clever and indirect. And that's one of the things that had struck me about Putin, that he had been clever and indirect in Crimea and Donbass and Georgia, but, but there were things about his rhetoric, some of which actually does echo Richard III, particularly the invocation of rape, um, that made me think, no, he's kind of slipped past those controls. So there's a lot more, obviously, we can talk there. The, the second thing that Shakespeare has to teach us, I believe, is he, through his understanding of politics as a form of theater. And in which there's, there are directors, there are playwrights, uh, there are actors, there are critics, there's an audience, multiple audiences, actually. And that's a very powerful metaphor. Um, in the book, I, I mention just one example of that. I, I once had a, a director speak to my students about how do you stage a play, and I asked, a Shakespeare play, and I asked him, what's the big decision that you make at the beginning? He said, the biggest decision is costuming and the stage set. And I said, really? Not the you know, deeper interpretation. I said, no. 
costuming and stage set. Well, if you think about that moment uh, when, say, the Russians launched the invasion of Ukraine, and Volodymyr Zelensky kind of gives this address, that's exactly what he did. He's dress, he, his costume is exactly right. It's olive drab. It's not a military uniform. He's a civilian leader, but he is, uh, to use a Shakespearean phrase, a warrior for the working day. And his stage set is the streets of Kiev. The way he's staged it is he has his advisors around him. Um, and he actually uses some Shakespearean and indeed Churchillian cadences. The chief of staff is here, the Minister of Defense is here, I'm here. And, and it's an, it was an extraordinarily powerful moment. And of course, the contrast had to be drawn, and I think Zelensky probably knew this because he's a talented actor, with Vladimir Putin glowering at a bunch of his cowed subordinates from a distance of 30 feet in you know, a really kind of kitschy um, palace. So theater, and we, we can explore that more. And then finally, um, Shakespeare talks about a number of different kinds of politics, but one kind that he spends a lot, on, a lot of time on is court politics. And just about any human organization is, at the end of the day, some kind of court. That is to say, there's somebody who's in charge, a, a king. There's a crown prince. Um, there are courtiers. Uh, they're all different kinds of characters. And you have, you have court politics. When I first went to work as counselor of the Department of State, a, an old uh, State Department hand who had been an ambassador multiple times, uh, said to me, welcome to the Knights of the Round Table. And actually, that was sort of how Secretary Rice uh, ran her senior leadership. You know, we would be kind of sent off on various quests to do things. Um, when I was a dean, I realized I was running a kind of a, a ducal court in a province of Hopkins Un Johns Hopkins University. There was, you know, the royal court was in the president's quarters in, uh, in Baltimore. It's a uniform form of politics. I think you see it everywhere, and Shakespeare's brilliant on it. And then finally, and, and with this I'll stop and hand things over to Yoni and, and Drew, um, I think the great thing that Shakespeare has to teach us is empathy. You know, um, there are some incredible villains in uh, Shakespeare, uh, one of whom I've already mentioned is Richard III. And, and yet, Shakespeare gives Richard a absolutely brilliant soliloquy where he's explaining to everybody how he really thinks and why he wants to be king. And he begins, it's actually not in the play Richard III, it's in Henry VI, part three, where he begins by describing his ambition in ways that are you know, pretty understandable. Um, he says, um, I don't have much of a chance of becoming king. And then, you know, well, maybe I can, you know, be a, uh, make my uh, heaven in a lady's lap, you know, I'll, I'll chase women. And then he realized, no, I'm really unattractive. I'm a hunchback, I have a withered arm. And, and more fundamentally, he knows he's unlovable. And so then, and then he moves to this kind of raging ambition, uh, which is it's claustrophobic, that he, he feels he's like one lost in a thorny wood who rends the thorns and is rent by the thorns. And then at the end, he says, you know, I can, I can smile and murder while I smile. And then before you know it, he, he, he is saying that, um, can I do all this and not win the crown? Tut, we're further off, I'd pluck it down. And, you know, you read that soliloquy, and if you spend time with it, you understand him. And you can empathize with him. And I think that's a tremendous quality if you want to understand powerful people and if you want to understand politics. The ability to crawl inside the skin of somebody who you probably really don't like, who maybe even is dangerous and pathological, but to understand them. And that, that I think, is perhaps Shakespeare's greatest gift. So that's my pitch on the book. Guys, tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> you know, when, when you told me you were working on a, a book about Shakespeare, I thought that's, that's terrific. That's just what the world needs is a book about Shakespeare that can rescue this Elizabethan playwright from his obscurity and introduce him to a global audience. Um, 
and, and I picked it up and, and uh, you know, did not expect to find things that, that I would not know in there because there have been books about Shakespeare and, and uh, you know, most of us have probably been assigned to read Shakespeare, have gone to Shakespeare plays, have, have marinated in it. Um, and, and I was surprised by what I saw inside. And I'll, I'll say my own introduction to Shakespeare came uh, as, as a kid in elementary school. I went to see the Kenneth Branagh version of uh, Henry V on the big screen. Um, and it was marvelous. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, um, this is very different than the way we read it aloud in, in class, right? Where, you know, you're reading it and, and stumbling over the words and, and here the drama was up there and it was easy to see, it was vividly rendered. Um, and so I gravitated toward your chapter here on Henry V. I was, was curious to see what you'd made of him. And that's when I think I, I started to grasp what this project was about. Um, because in your rendering, um, the Henry that, that I watched as, as a boy is, is there. He's vivid. Um, he is a vividly malignant narcissistic sociopath, um, <laughs> manipulating everyone around him for his own ends. Uh, the scenes that uh, I, I thrilled to as, as a child, watching him uh, fire up his own followers, uh, lead them to glory on the battlefield, are, are rendered um, with the, the knowing uh, uh, understanding of somebody who has been in the halls of power during a march to war, who has seen the way in which leaders rally the troops on a battlefield, and, and then seeing those leaders uh, when they're not rallying the troops, and, and understands that um, the same things that can uh, lead to, to inspiring uh, speeches and, and uh, uh, successful manipulation of, of a country in, into war um, can come from dark places as, as, as well, and, and that um, there is, at the center of Henry V, um, a deep ambition uh, a, a willingness um, to uh, use the stagecraft of leadership to manipulate those around him, uh, a really keenly attuned sense of how it all plays and, and the purposefulness of it was, was something which, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't grasp in fifth grade, but, but did <laughs> coming back to it, to it now. And, and that chapter, for me at least, um, frame the project. Um, as I read through the, the different studies of, of different Shakespearean leaders, um, I, saw, uh, I saw the cast of characters you usually run into at a book event in Washington, um, where, where they're, they're sort of rubbing elbows with each other, they're, they're ambitious, the core politics are in, are in full swing, um, and, and you, you watch as people try to float a little longer on, on the Sea of Glory. And, and that, for me, was what made this um, uh, really marvelous and original, right? This wasn't another Washington Insider book. I've read those. Uh, it wasn't a, a study of, of Shakespeare alone, which, which I've also read. But um, it, it blended the two to come up with something um, genuinely novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just seconding what Yoni said, and I think I was saying this to you, Elliot, before we went on camera, I, I, I've read uh, many, many, many Shakespeare <laughs> books, uh, and I think he's, he has to be the most written about author uh, in the history of, of the world. Um, so it must be a daunting thing to be an author and to, to embark on writing anything having to do with Shakespeare. But I, I was reading this book and enjoying it, and not only enjoying it, gaining insight from it and thinking to myself as I read, you know, I can't think of another Shakespeare book quite like this because it's one that is being written by someone who has been in the room, so to speak, at which these uh, decisions of moment are being reached, who has been a, a, a student of the personalities of people who are attracted to power, right? And you are bringing your own special skill set, Eliot, to the plays and vice versa, using the plays in order to understand better the world that we are in. I mean, Hamlet says that the, the theater is the abstract and brief chronicle of the time, and I think that remains true in 2023, much as it was in 1599 or 1601. Also, Bill was saying, he, he, he led off with Lincoln, and it reminded me of a Clinton story, which is that the uh, Harvard professor, Stephen Greenblatt, famous Shakespearean, was at the, the White House in the late 90s, and this was around the time of, uh, you know, the Kenneth Starr impeachment uh, sex scandal, right? As you write in the book, sex scandals are, are nothing new, Mark Antony, and Cleopatra are going through a kind of late 90s moment in that play. And uh, Greenblatt, he's shaking hands with President Clinton. 
and he sees his opportunity. He says, uh, uh, I, I have a question for you about Macbeth. Don't you think it's a play about a man who pursues his own passions to the immense ruination of the country and his own happiness? <laughs> um, and the point is. And Clinton, yeah. uh, well, uh, the point is that Clinton doesn't even miss a beat. He looks directly at Greenblatt and says, Macbeth is the story of a man whose immense ambition has no adequate ethical object. Interesting. And it gives you a sense of Clinton as a person who could, yeah. who has thought deeply about Macbeth, has studied Macbeth. Macbeth was Lincoln's favorite Shakespeare play, and he was reading passages from it on a boat in the Potomac River, I think less than a week before he was assassinated at Ford's Theater. So uh, there's something about Shakespeare that not just theater audiences or scholars have been drawn to Shakespeare in order to understand politics in themselves, but presidents, right? Uh, so it tells you about Clinton, the Shakespeare fan, as well as Clinton, the politician, that he could come up with a devastating uh, a response, right, in a kind of Prince Hal type way uh, to, a, to a, a little bit of a rude uh, question, right, being thrown at him by this scholar. And I think that's what makes Shakespeare so special. And I think that your book, by, by taking a kind of a, a prismatic approach to the plays, by not marching us through them chronologically, and we've all read those, those doorstops, right? Thank you, Harold Bloom, for writing 900 pages on, on how Shakespeare invents all of humanity, right? You're looking at one aspect of humanity, which is the pursuit of not just politics, but the pursuit of power yeah. specifically. And the other thing I would say about the book is that um, there's not a lot of nice people in this book. Uh, Shakespeare seems to understand something, and you mentioned his empathy, right? Uh, and Coleridge calls this the, the negative capability of Shakespeare, that he's able to imagine people uh, who are motivated by horrible urges, right? He's able to empathize with those characters, which is not the same thing as sympathizing with them, but imaginatively inhabit them. And he understands something about whether it was close observation of, of Cecil and Queen Elizabeth's court or King James and his court, he understands that um, po politicians are capable of empathy in a similar way to Shakespeare himself as a playwright, but they're not, they're not sympathizing with people. You have a wonderful, there's a piquant phrase where you talk about Henry V, that he does not sympathize with his subjects, but he does empathize yeah. with them. He thinks that they are foolish, he thinks that they're idiots, right? He, he thinks that they can be manipulated and led into a war that he is starting for reasons of self-glorification. He's, he's kind of doing a Putin-like thing. He's invading a country on a thinly veiled pretext, right? But he can empathize with them so that he walks around like Zelensky in the right garb and he gives a rousing speech and God damn it, we all wanna go onto the breach with him, right? Uh, so Shakespeare, in his genius, is able to look at the political personality and find across all of his plays certain common characteristics that unite uh, the, the personalities that pursue pl uh, power. Yeah. And I think your book is a kind of taxonomy, psychologically, of this very specific kind of collection of traits, yeah. which is well, fascinating. Well, well, thanks. I mean, I think I agree with... I agree with that, and I agree with uh, with both of you. I, I, you know, on Henry V, one of the things that, um, but this is actually true of a lot of Shakespeare. The, the thing that gets me is it's not just that Henry V can pull the wool over the eyes of his of his um, subjects, or that he can fool the conspirators against him. He does it to us, and you know, it's very hard to to watch the Kenneth Branagh version or, or many of the other versions without being swept up in the St. Crispin's Day speech and believing all the guff at the end when he's seducing this French princess whose relatives he's just been massacring with a, with a I'm just a bluff old soldier uh, act. I mean, I remember I was, I learned a lot about Shakespeare from my students and I remember there was one class where we were going through Henry V and, you know, I kind of laid out my, my indictment of the guy, I thought pretty convincingly, and, you know, they were agreeing, and then I, then I said, okay, if Henry V walked into the room right now and says, follow me, how many of us would follow him? All the hands go up. 
And part of Shakespeare's genius is he gives you all the information you need to know that you're dealing with somebody who's really problematic here. But we somehow get, get swept along. The other thing I, I just, um, I was thinking about um, Abraham Lincoln and Macbeth, um, which was his favorite play. And of course, the, the passage he quotes on the steamer going back um, to, to Washington, I think only five days before he's assassinated, is better to be with the dead whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace, and so on. And, uh, and that he's, treason has done his worst. It's actually Macbeth's speech after he has murdered Duncan. But it, it's, it's a very dark passage. But the, the deeper question for me, and I'd be curious to know what the two of you think about this, is why did Abraham Lincoln like Macbeth so much? Hmm. I mean, he, I don't think it's because he was, he was saying to himself, well, the reason why I like Macbeth is, you know, the bad guy loses in the end. I don't think that's what that's about. I think it touched something in him, which maybe he was afraid of, which maybe he simply understood. But I'd be curious to know what your, your reactions are. Because there have been, and there have been a lot of politicians who've liked Shakespeare. Yeah, and that Clinton story is, is an interesting insight too, right? Because he's reading Macbeth differently than you read yep. Macbeth. Uh, Clinton looks at the guy and says, gosh, if only it had just been directed you know, 10 degrees this way toward a slightly more ethical object, it would have been a great inspirational tale, um, <laughs> which is a politician's read of the play for sure. Um, and and you know, Lincoln's disposition has always seemed to me a little bit different. Uh, he's a guy who um, brings a, a, a tremendous empathy with him into, into politics, uh, as does Clinton. But, but it's an empathy born of a kind of humility that is, he, he uh, repeatedly stresses um, how, how narrow the distance is between uh, the claims he's making and those his opponents are making. That, that they, you know, they worship the same God, they, yeah. right? Like that there's, a, there's a sense uh, deep within much of Lincoln's public rhetoric um, that uh, he wonders whether he might be fooling himself. Um, whether he and, and everyone else around him uh, has, has fallen victim to their own illusion, uh, how, how dangerous the temptation of self-righteousness is. Uh, and, and when you see him reading Macbeth and focusing on the dark passages, um, it's that self-doubt which, which is a tremendous leadership advantage for Lincoln, right? He, he, it, it both sort of destroys him, lays him low, leaves him struggling with depression at times, but also uh, enables him to do things that um, other much more experienced politicians nationally have not been able to do. Um, but that's what I, I see at least. I'd be curious what, what you think because you know the play so much better. Well, I mean, there are obviously biographical reasons why it's tempting to say that Lincoln would have been drawn to a play like Macbeth. I mean, he also knew what it was like to lose a child. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the great cruxes, one of the great lacuna in the text is have the Macbeths yeah. had a child that has passed on. He had a troubled marriage, right, to Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, who also believed in ghosts and witchcraft and magic, right? So that's one aspect of it. Also, does Lincoln have a proleptic imagination, which is what some critics have said Macbeth has, that he's able to see the future in the instant. There's a sense in which Macbeth is a little bit like Brutus, where he understands that he could be the one to seize power through murder. But unlike Brutus, Macbeth is able to know that in doing this act, he will go over to the other side and not be able to stop. Right? If you look at the conversations between him and Lady Macbeth in the play, it's fascinating because she's urging him on and he's saying no, no, no. And then once he kills Duncan, she becomes stuck. She's unable to wash the blood away from her hands and he has just become this murderous killing machine. Um, Br Brutus fools himself into thinking that, uh, okay, I can do this just by, we can do this just, just the one by, act. Just one act. Just a little bit and, of a and, patricide. You know, and we're going to offer him up as a sacrifice. We're not going to butcher him. Um, and of course, that, that's political folly, um, as very quickly becomes apparent. But you know, at the end of his life, Brutus retains some element of um, element of nobility. So I, 
you know, one, one thing I talk a little bit about in the book, and again, I'm really curious to know what, what you think. So, it's, okay, Blake, Lincoln loved Shakespeare. Um, Churchill loved Shakespeare. I, I quote this very famous story with Richard Burton shortly after World War II is in, um, playing Hamlet. And he gets the word, you know, the old man's going to be in the audience. There's only one old man. <laughs> and as he's speaking, he hears this kind of rumble in the front row, and it's Churchill who's kind of giving the speeches along with him, <laughs> which is very unnerving. And he says, you know, I tried to speed up, I tried to slow down, I couldn't shake him off. <laughs> and uh, then it, the story concludes, uh, you know, he's, he's a complete nervous wreck at the intermission. He uh, goes to the, his um, the green room, and uh, there's a knock at the door. <laughs> it's Churchill's. Lord Hamlet, may I use your washroom? <laughs> but, but, okay, so you have that. And, and Churchill really did know his Shakespeare, I mean, including like obscure parts of Henry VI. Um, but here's the thing that I find a little bit disturbing. Uh, the Nazis kind of like Shakespeare too. I mean, Drew, I remember when we, I went with a bunch of my students to, uh, we went to see Coriolanus. Yeah. And you were good enough to speak to us about it. And the, you know, that was a play they really liked. They, for obvious reasons, they liked Merchant of Venice. Uh, but they liked other Shakespeare plays too. So what do we make of that? Yoni's looking at, at me again. <laughs> again. I, mean, uh, it, I mean, it is an established fact that Hitler and the Nazis viewed Shakespeare and specifically Coriolanus as a kind of uh, learning play, a Lehrstücke, right? That it could be didactically uh, performed by Nazi youth groups as a model of, or a tragedy of a patrician, an elite, an ubermensch who is brought low, betrayed, right? By those who are jealous of him in some ways. Um, and you know, people, people go back and forth about the politics of Shakespeare, right? Does he himself have a political ideology that can be decoded in the plays. And you talk about this in your afterword, your epilogue. I'm, I'm doubtful Elliot. about that. Um, some people say he's an anti-democratic writer because the only time that we see mass movements in his plays, it's the mob with Julius Caesar, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. It's Jack Cade's rebellion in Henry VI part two. You know, it's Coriolanus with the, yep. the plebeians attack, like throwing things at Coriolanus and him having this horrible abuse, this verbal abuse of them. So there does seem to be a, a fear of the, of, the, of the mass or of the mob, right? A distrust of the people that is articulated in Shakespeare's plays. Is that the same thing as saying that he thinks democracy is unworkable? Who knows? I mean, at the same time that Hitler loves Coriolanus, Bertolt Brecht, the famous communist playwright in East Germany, adapts Coriolanus because for him, it's a study of a mass uprising and how the people can take the power back against a tyrannical fascist leader. So you can look at the plays from the bottom up as well as from the yeah. top down and find arguments. In both. And I think this is why we're drawn to Shakespeare so continuously is that you can't find him in the plays. You can find the, the interactions between his characters in the plays, which is a different thing. It's, it's, he's not like a George Bernard Shaw where you get a very clear idea of what he means by Fabianism if you, if you read Major Barbara. Uh, there's not that didactic quality in Shakespeare, even though he's been used to those purposes by various political figures. You know, there's a little, um, there's also the, the smaller moments. Um, of course, I, you know, it, the mob never looks particularly good, but then neither do the aristocrats and uh, the kings. I mean, there are uh, problems there. Coriolanus is one of the stories I, I tell in the book. There's this great moment when, so for those of you who haven't seen or read Coriolanus recently, it's this Roman general who is a great general, has a terrific command of invective, uh, and is politically a complete dunce. Um, I've met one or two like that. Um, and, you know, he, he, but he's been so successful that he is on the verge of really getting his, his ambition, or really his mother's ambition, which is that he be made consul. And, even, and you know, and the populace who, they understand his strengths and his weaknesses. So, you know, I think it, it's, there, there's some balance in Shakespeare's portrayal of them, but they have a clamor, which is, show us your wounds. And of course, he's been scarred all over. And he just 
detonates and he's furious. And here again, I, I learned from my students when I was teaching this. So teaching at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, these are graduate students. And I knew that in the class there were at least half a dozen who had been in very hard places. Uh, the military or the intelligence world and places like Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. And I asked them, and I said, don't feel obliged to answer this. Uh, has anybody ever asked to see your wounds? And boy, we had a very intense half hour after that because they, they didn't like Coriolanus as, as a human being, but they completely got the anger at people who are sort of voyeur, voyeuristically wanting to see their wounds. Yeah, that was an interesting, an arresting moment in the book for me because we introduced this by saying that the book is informed by your decades in the corridors of power and you talked about courtly politics, but it's one of several moments in here where the insight comes not from some politician or some general, but from students, yeah. um, from people who are reading these plays and, and finding themselves in the characters. Uh, maybe they, they were never the, the ruling duke, but um, they, they find something in, in a Shakespearean character that resonates with their own experience. Uh, were there other moments like that, that that stand out for you, things that you learned from your well, students? Well, you know, that Henry V moment was very striking to me, that they, um, where, where they said, yeah, we understand everything you're saying, and you're, you're probably right, and we would still follow him. Uh, there was another moment where, which again, again I mentioned in the book, um, Cymbeline, which is a play that's not put on <laughs> very often. Maybe you can fix that. For, for good me. reason. Uh -huh. uh, Sorry, I, I fans can, of Cymbeline out here. <laughs> I, I can imagine it's hell to put on. Um, but there are these two princes who've been kidnapped, and they've been, they're being raised in the mountains by a kind of disgraced courtier. And there, there's this wonderful interaction between them where they're saying, okay, really tell us stories about the courtiers. And he's trying to say, it's not what you think. You know, it's, you, your life is precarious, you know. You, you can do your best and still stumble and fall and fail and they go yeah 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 we understand that but you know you're old and we're young and you're speaking from experience and we we haven't had that experience and we want it and so that was a moment where and i've, I've had students like that you know and one has students like that and I, more broadly i think i found myself writing the book in part for students um, it's written for Lots of people. I mean, it'd be the hopefully the Shakespeare aficionados, hopefully the uh, the power junkies. Uh, uh, you know, if there's a vast corporate market, I'd be even more delighted since they pay full price for the hardcover and they don't wait for the <laughs> for the for the paperback. Well, it's interesting, Elliot, because when you talk about Coriolanus in the book, you talk about the two princes, the sons yeah. of Belarius, and also Clotin, yeah, who is this? Um, he's he's the prince who's grown up in the court, yeah. And it becomes very clear that he is a, a murderous, uh, a, a would-be rapist, right? He's, he is a, someone who just acts as if anything yep. can be taken, yep. right? He's a creature of incredibly venal, vicious right. appetite. He's also dumb. And he's stupid, a figure who is mocked by other people in the play as a figure of comedy, but also is dangerous because and, of... And who, but who they nonetheless enable. Right. And you make this very interesting point that in corporate succession, often the chosen courtier, or the, the heir apparent. Yeah. And I think you used the example of Jack Welch and GE. And, and, and Jeffrey Imel were an elaborate succession planning. Losing $150 billion worth of yeah. uh, market value because they chose the wrong yeah. prince who grew up too close to the yeah. court and was corrupted by it. Whereas you say that Prince Hal, who goes off and hangs out with Falstaff and East Cheap, is more like Steve Jobs choosing Tim Cook, this guy who's attitudinally opposite from him and distant from the world of Apple, who's proven to be a roaring success. I thought the, the parallels with contemporary sociopolitics were really one of the most fascinating oh, well, elements of the book. From, and you know, back to Lincoln, you mentioned Lincoln in comparison to Henry IV, 
who deposes Richard II and uh, has him murdered in the Tower of London. And just circling back to our Lincoln discussion, you know, does Lincoln know that it's the right thing to do to have the Civil War, right? And in fact, staging something, I didn't know this because I'm not a historian, but having a naval uh, ship blown up in Fort Sumter in Charleston, forcing them into starting the yeah. Civil War, the South. But does he know that there's a terrible moral cost that yeah, will I, come I mean, with I, that? I do think that's at the heart of Lincoln, that he, he you know, morally a very sensitive man, but who is, knows he has to do the Willing things to he has do to do, the but, but things. understands that you pay a price for it. I just wanted to close the loop briefly on, you know, you mentioned students. You know, I re really, in some ways, the audience for this, one of the audiences, key audiences, is people who do want to be in the room where the decisions are made um, and who are ambitious and ambition is a good thing and if you didn't have ambition including political ambition or ambition to lead a company or a university or something like that um, we, we wouldn't get anywhere I mean, ambition is a necessary driver of human activity but, but hopefully part of this is a bit of a warning as well which I think Shakespeare you know I think Shakespeare can uh, can offer us um, I, I wonder, I mean, Yoni, you know, you're a really acute observer of the political world. One thing I've, I've wondered about is, in the old days, uh, you know, everybody read Shakespeare one way or another, and you know, even if you look at rhetoric, um, you can see it's suffused with Shakespearean tropes and phrases and so on. Do you think we've lost that? That kind of literacy, which was in the background in an earlier age when people were a bit more attuned to uh, Shakespeare, or at least have been exposed to it. And if so, do you think it has any consequences? Yeah, but both of you have written recently about uh, the way that Shakespeare is, is under attack from both the, the left and the right, um, and, and some schools are, are dropping him from the curriculum or censoring the plays in one way or another. Um, so it, it's no longer as, as central to, to the sort of the pedagogical curriculum. It's also just not something that um, you know, we, we, we have disestablished the canon for better or for, for worse. Um, one of the effects of this, I think, is uh, we have lost the language of character um, from the public discourse. Uh, and, and these are characterological studies for the most part that you present to us. Um, but when you hear politicians speak, when you hear political commentators speak, uh, they talk in terms of consequences, they talk in terms of agendas and policies, polls. They very seldom discuss uh, character, um, the, the language that Shakespeare deploys uh, to describe people uh, is alien in, in many ways uh, to the way that, that we discuss um, our contemporary rulers and, and generals. Uh, and, and if there's a loss, that's I think where I would focus in, that uh, I, I, um, I think over the last decade, many of us have been reminded that character is an utterly essential part of political analysis. If you want to understand not just what politicians will do in office, uh, but what those around them will do, how they'll respond to having their, um, their commitments tested, uh, where they'll draw lines or, or not, whether they'll, uh, uh, like Brutus, try one act and, and delude themselves as to the consequences, like Macbeth, uh, try one act and then plunge headlong forward. Um, those are questions of character, and we don't talk very much about character. We don't think about it in, in a public way anymore. And, and that, I think, is a loss. It's a loss uh, from our, our public intellectual life, but it's also a profound loss for, for a democracy. Uh, ultimately, um, the people of a democracy are, are asked to judge their leaders in these terms, right? And if you, if you go back and, and you read uh, uh, the founders uh, and, and those who were involved in, in the, the second founding around the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, they're all reading Shakespeare. They're all thinking about uh, characterological flaws. They're all trying to devise systems that can compensate for them, um, that can offset the downside risks of, of corrupt character. Uh, um, and if, if you read contemporary political analysis, that stuff is, is largely absent. Um, so it's not just sort of losing the marvelous cadences and the phrases, uh, it's losing the deeper truths that Shakespeare is, is pointing to and, and truth which, although he's writing them from the monarchical system are probably, if anything, uh, even more valuable than a democracy. 
You know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking of uh, Martin Luther King's line that he looks to the day when his uh, children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And as you were speaking, I was, I was thinking, you know, can I imagine a public leader, saying that let alone now. a politician, saying that and meaning it in the way that I think King meant it? But I also think, Elliot, one of the really moving things about your book is that you do sound this theme of caution, of, of telling your students or prospective students yeah. who want to be in that room that power com the pursuit of power comes at a great personal price. And that there's a reason it's called the hollow crown and yeah. not the crown that is full of happiness and fulfillment. <laughs> um, that, that the pursuit of power comes at a great personal cost and a great personal sacrifice. And if you look at Henry V, if you look at Fortinbras, Octavius, uh, if you look at um, Richmond at the end of Richard III, these people are ciphers. They have no characters. Right. They have nothing but the pursuit yeah. of power. And I think that that's another thing to think about with Shakespeare is that he is also giving us in his plays things other than politics yes. that help, yes. help us appreciate what life is. Right. That's the book I didn't write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so those things are always yeah. in concert in his plays is that banish Happy Jack, banish Jack Falstaff, and you banish all of the world. And Prince Hal says, I do. I will. Yeah, that's a chilling... That, that's a chilling moment. And it's the moment when the audience realizes that this character is in some sense not redeemable. That he doesn't, he's willing to sacrifice his humanity yeah. in the pursuit of power. And if you go through the plays one by one, each of them, Prospero has lost his humanity and recovers it in a very hard won, hard fought battle by the end of that play in The Tempest. You know, the, the original title of the book was going to be Rough Magic uh, because Prospero. At, at the end of the Tempest, so this deposed Duke of Milan, who's a great magician, who's on this desert island, and he, he finally gets all of his enemies where he wants them, and he spares them, and, and he goes through a, meta, a metamorphosis, but he's going to be restored as Duke of Milan. And he says, I abjure this rough magic. I'll break my staff and bury it several fathoms deep. And, deeper than did plummet every sound, I'll drown my book, presumably his, his book of magic spells. And um, I think one of, part of Shakespeare's genius is he does think of power as rough magic. I've got a chapter in here about magic, uh, which I've been, I'm, I'm an amateur magician, so I like magic. But, <laughs> but, but I think, I, I'm fascinated by the way Shakespeare plays with magic, because it's in a way it's there, it naturally never really determines anything. So. Joan of Arc, who gets burned as a witch, her success, he doesn't depict any of her successes as resulting from magical powers, but she's begun to believe in it. And I think that's another thing we sometimes see with political people, that they begin to believe in their own, in their own magic. And boy, does that, you know, does that get you into yeah, that's a That's trouble. a big surprise. That's a shocker in that chapter when you talk about the contemporary politician who drinks his own Kool-Aid, who believes, has a magical self-conception, yeah. as you put it, Elliot. I thought that was fascinating to think about. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think it, does, uh, it does happen. And there's a, there's a through line there in your attention to the stagecraft, right? Yeah. And, and to magic. Um, although Shakespeare uses magic in a slightly different sense. Yeah. But as an amateur magician, it's about uh, the direction of attention, um, the manipulation of expectation. Um, and and there's, there's a way in which um, that is theater. Um, so you, you may not be a Shakespearean performer, but you're out there. Um, well, well, Shakespeare is a bit of a magician. You know, the, one of the things in, um, when you're doing card tricks is that people see, it's not that people don't see the thing, they see the thing, they just don't understand the thing. And I think Shakespeare does that to us. It's that you can never completely conceal the dirty work, but you just don't know. So maybe because it just goes by so quickly, you know, Henry V ordering the massacre of the French prisoners, mm. or other, you know, kind of little moments like I mean, one of the things that's always struck me about the end of Henry V is, uh, you know, why does the chorus, who has been cheerleading for Henry throughout the whole play, at the end says, oh, you know, we've just tried to capture what this incredibly great man and, you know, 
these fantastic deeds in, in our own little inadequate way. And uh, by the way, you know, he dies young and his son was an infant. And so, you know, all the realms that he captured are kind of fall apart. We'll see you later at the next play. And it, it's, you know, it's, why is he doing that? And I think it's, again, I, I think that's actually that the end of the play is one of the most powerful things in it because he's saying, yeah, all this stuff about glory didn't last, didn't last. And, and I think, you know, to go back to, to Prospero, I think that's, he does recover his humanity. I mean, he's still, he's paid a price. Um, and when he leaves, I think he says, every third thought will be of death. Yeah, Lear, Lear and Prospero, in your final chapter, you talk about them undergoing the divestiture of power, either willingly or unwillingly, as it may be. And this, this final moment of Aristotelian anagnoresis of recognition of humanity, which is what we have at the end of our lives. And you, you do talk movingly about being at the United Nations and seeing the old, the old guard right, sitting alone in a conference room and yep. people don't even know who they were yep. right, or what they did. It's just kind of the, these cycles that Shakespeare is fascinated by, which we still play out in our theatrical politics today. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, the most important message of the book is, you know, power is not the most important thing, folks. We have about five, seven minutes left for questions from the audience in the room here. Please just um, raise your hand. We've got a microphone. Sir, please uh, identify yourself and uh, keep it to a question, please. Thank you. Hello there. My name is Ujvala Pluri. I'm an international trade analyst at U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And my question for you is, during this time of Shakespeare, we had the whole religious reform movements taking place across Europe, like the Protestant Reformation, Calvinism, Lutheranism, as well as Anglicanism, you know, under King Henry VIII. And a lot of that Protestant work ethic was based on like morals, serving a higher purpose, you know, you know not you know, resorting to like, for example, selfish motives to, you know, do something. And so my question is, to what extent are these plays that he wrote more from a sense of warning or caution based on the times of that Shakespeare was in? I guess that's my question, is to what extent was it more of like a sort of like a moral lesson taught through the mistakes made by these figures in these stories by Shakespeare for an audience that was going through what was a religious reformation at the time? You know, f f for me, the um, the key thing about any of these plays is we still put them on, we, which would suggest to me that he's touching things which are universal and in some way timeless. And I think we, that's a very hard thing for us to accept. I and mean, we don't really like that. This is why I think we get these sort of nonsensical arguments that Shakespeare couldn't have been Shakespeare. Um, he was a genius, and uh, yeah, he was close enough to the court that he actually saw politics and understood, but I think he, there was a, he, he was writing about human nature, and, um, and, and, you know, and I don't mean to criticize other kinds of books about Shakespeare, which are very much about, you know, where does this come from? James Shapiro has written a couple of wonderful books of this kind, where he, you know, The Year of Lear, what, was, what else was going on? How might that have shaped the play and so forth? And that's, that's obviously perfectly legitimate and it's very interesting. But for me, what's interesting about Shakespeare is the timelessness of it. And uh, that really is rooted in character. And like I said, I, th I think you know, it was natural for him to write about courts, although he also writes about ancient Rome and then he writes about completely imaginary places like the coast of Bohemia, um, which is a neat trick since Czech Republic is a landlocked country. Um, but but I, I think he's, he, what he, and Drew, you'd probably have a, uh, the best uh, approach to this. You know, he has an enormous amount of raw material that's lying out there in British history, in ancient history, and in his own fertile imagination. And so he just reaches for it and plays with it. And, and I think that's actually one of the reasons why he does some of the crazy stuff he does in Cymbeline. <laughs> right. he's, he's playing around. He's, he is exercising an enormous talent um, and seeing what he can do with it. 
And that's oh, why he invents words. Yoni was asking me what my favorite Shakespeare play is, which is always the kind of getting to know you question that I get <laughs> when we're schmoozing before the event. And it's, it's really every single play is so different, yeah. right? And what's radical about Shakespeare is, yes, you can draw moral lessons, but he does not judge. He, gi he yeah. gives you Richard III, and he even makes you root for Richard III in all these monstrous things that he does. Right? He gives you access to these things. And I think you write somewhere in the book that like, it does allow you to appreciate these, thing, these, yeah. these monsters like Hitler. You can, you can imagine what Hitler would see in a Shakespeare play. Yeah. So there's, a, there's as much immorality and amorality in Shakespeare as there are moral lessons to be defined. It's, it's, a, it's up to us. It's a measure of our character, what moral lessons we draw. Because if, if you want the bad stuff, it's all the dirty stuff, the violent stuff, the, yeah. the gory stuff, that's all in there too. That's what's radical about Shakespeare. Can, can we think of an, another author who has that same quality of just saying, this is the world as it is, and you, you figure out what you make of it. I mean, is there... Cervantes, maybe? The Old Testament? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, to, to go back to the, the question, in a, in a world of moral didacticism, um, Shakespeare's plays stand out for their era in his, um, his aversion to that, right? Yeah. So, so if, if it's shaped by that context, maybe this is the historian talking right now. I always want to find the, the, the contextual analysis. But maybe it's in part a reaction against that particular tendency, uh, um, that, that he is uh, very affirmatively shaping plays which are not easy to read, which don't yield clear, satisfying, moralistic lessons in the final act. And even where they appear to, that probably means you should go back and, and watch it again from the beginning. And there's a, there's a huge body of literature on whether his father was a Catholic and what his own religion right. was. Right. And he was living during a time of tremendous political and social and religious upheaval, which would have made him even more interested in ambiguity, right? Yeah. Of not wanting to identify with one side or the other, right? Because he doesn't want to end up burned at the stake Right, like a religious martyr would in that time, or having his head on the Tower of London. Which is why it's so interesting that today, when people really do want kind of a, a moral position being staked out, that he gets a lot of grief on both left and right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've written about this in the New York Times. I wrote about this for you in the Atlantic. Um, I, I, he has, runs very much counter to the spirit of our times right now. And, I mean, Samuel Johnson said he's a mirror of life. That's, and, I, and I agree with you. I think that's what he, want, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to write about all of, all of life. And so maybe only an author like Balzac even came close in trying to, I'm going to give you the whole human comedy. We've got time for one more quick question David. over here. <clears throat> I'm uh, David Smith of The Guardian. Uh, what did you find Shakespeare has to say about uh, what's now known as identity politics? Um, gender, for example, the taming of the shrew, race, uh, Othello, uh, sexuality, and uh, do those things look different depending on current events? So I, you know, I think you can write, um, and people do, do a lot of work on Shakespeare and gender and uh, Shakespeare and racial identity. You know, going back to The Tempest, there's been a lot of very, they're very interesting productions where, uh, which, where Caliban is portrayed as a very sympathetic figure in the New World who's being enslaved by, uh, by Europeans. And you know, there's, there is an artistry, obviously, in dramatic production, which allows you to do that, particularly if you're willing to cut out a few difficult passages. I, I, first, I, partly because of my, just my own views, I don't like um, identity-driven uh, discussions because I do think he's about character. I mean, Othello, there, there are debates about Othello, how much of this is actually racial. Uh, I mean, is, is, you know, he's frequently portrayed as having very dark skin. He's a Moor, maybe, maybe, maybe not. You can do it, and, and of course, the doors of interpretation are um, are open, but but I don't think that's, I really don't think that's at the heart of Shakespeare. He has, um, he is, you know, I'd fall back on that he's profoundly interested in character. And, you know, I, there's a, a wonderful quote uh, from W.B. Du Bois, who was a, 
um, you know, extremely formidable African American and uh, intellectual who was very at odds with um, the established racial order in the United States in the early 20th century. And he has this beautiful line, he says, I, I sit next to Shakespeare and he does not wince. Mm. Um, you know, he, he saw, or, or Nelson Mandela, you know, in the Robin Island Shakespeare, you know, signing his name next to uh, um, that famous quote from Julius Baker, Caesar about cowards die uh, a thousand deaths. And, and so I, I, that's why there's something in it for everybody. And I think at, at some level to try to reduce it to um, identitarian politics is to miss a lot of what he has to teach us. But I don't know what you guys think. Well, I, I would agree with that. I would just add um, Shakespeare changes. There's a, there's a wonderful book by Frank Kermode on mm. Shakespeare's language where he really studies the stylistic evolution of Shakespeare. But it's also a little bit of an ideological evolution. How could the same playwright who wrote Katerina and Taming of the Shrew yeah. write Rosalind and Beatrice, write Rosalind and As You Like It, Beatrice and Much Ado About Nothing, two of the most sublime female characters in all of drama. Uh, there is this sympathy that Shakespeare has for the marginalized figure, the outcast, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice, who, is, you, describe as, who you describe as a villain in the, in the play, and he does structurally serve as a villain in the play's dramaturgy, but he is, to a modern audience, the most right. sympathetic character. And Shakespeare does empathize Auden, with the Jewish I, character I think, in a way that no other playwright from his I entire think generation did. W.H. Auden said he's the only serious figure in right, the play. Right. Um, and the I, Christians I, are all foolish and greedy and bigoted. Right. And, and so there is, there is an interest that he has. It's not having to do with power. Right, because that's the top of the social hierarchy, but he's equally interested in these positions on the periphery of the social hierarchy and what life is like for Caliban or for Shylock or for Othello, right? I, I don't know about you, you know, we, we both, I, I went to a, an Orthodox Hebrew day school, uh, and I suspect you did as well. We read Merchant of Venice. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I remember those, we had, we had a wonderful English teacher uh, and we really went through that wonderful Hathanah and Jewai's um, speech, which I, mean, I remember committing to memory. And, and, and I think, again, that's part of the genius of Shakespeare. I mean, I think Sh Shylock is the villain. I, I, don't, I don't think you can dodge that. <laughs> it, it just is. Uh, in the same way, I, I don't think you can make Caliban more noble than what he is. But, but the genius of Shakespeare is he can make you empathize with Shylock. He can make you see the world as he sees you can, He can make you see the world as Caliban sees, sees it. I, that's, that's such a marvelous gift and uh, something that's so important in any walk of life, but particularly one that involves uh, the exercise of power over other people. And maybe Merchant of Venice, since we're all of a Hebraic persuasion here at this table, maybe it's a good example of how personal these things can become. Yes. And also just anecdotally, every time we produce that play at the Shakespeare Theater, we get letters from, and emails from people saying this, this play is anti-Semitic and I am not going to subscribe in the future. And then every time we do it, it sells very well and people want to come see the play. So that would actually be my answer, which is I, <laughs> I'm not going to forgive the man his bigotries, but neither would I allow them to deny me or any of us access to the things that he offers. Right? So I, I don't, I, you, you can contextualize and explain, and there are things in, in the plays that, that don't accord with my own views, and, and I imagine don't accord with the, the views of yeah. any member of, of his audience. He, he encompasses a great deal, and the world has changed in the intervening years. Yeah. Um, but to set it aside on the basis of um, those passages and, and those characters and, and lose everything else that, as you show us, he has to offer us, I think will be a, a tremendous tragedy. Yeah. Please join me in uh, thanking and giving a round of applause to our speakers. The book is The Hollow Crown. The author is Elliot Cohen. The publisher is Basic Books. So get straight to Politics and Prose or to Amazon or even to CSIS, and we'll make sure that you're taken care of. Thank you very much, and have a good day.